Good morning to you. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Primero de Corintios, capítulo 14, verso 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. That is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study together this morning. We have visitors. We're thankful that you're here. If you're able to stick around a little while after services so that we can meet you and get to know you a little bit better, we certainly would appreciate that. But thank you so much for being here with us today. We'll meet again this evening at 5 o'clock, and we'd love to have you assemble with us then if you're able to. Our theme uh, for this year has been one another. Our elders have all gotten to speak on it. I haven't got to speak on it yet, so I'm going to take this morning to talk a little bit about this and uh, per- perhaps a little bit of a, of a different uh, perspective on this. But I want us to talk about one another this morning in the context specifically of how we think about each other, how we interact with each other is first based on what we think about each other and how we think about each other. And so this morning in the time that we have, I'd like for us to consider how it is that we engage intrapersonally with each other. When we talk about interpersonal communication, we're talking about the way that we communicate one to another, like we're doing right now. I'm speaking. This is interpersonal communication. And the feedback you're giving me, whether you're nodding, whether you're smiling, whether you're shaking your head no or sleeping, that is interpersonal communication back to me. But then you have what's called intrapersonal communication, and this is about no one else except for me. And this is how I communicate with myself. This is self-talk. Intrapersonal communication is communication that exists or, cons- or, or occurs rather within the self. It occurs in one's mind. It is, as we have noted, fundamentally different than interpersonal communication. Intrapersonal communication doesn't get a whole lot of attention But I would submit to you that it is a solidly biblical concept, and therefore it's worthy of our examination. A few passages to start with. You're there with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look at verse 20. Paul talks to us under the inspiration of the Spirit and says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be Mature. So the way that we think, intrapersonal communication, the way that we think is to be mature, not evil, not childlike, someone who is of age, someone who is mature, someone who has wisdom. We are to take care how we think. A few pages over, look at the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, Philippians capitulo 4, verso 8. Philippians chapter 4, it begins by saying in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So again, here is our thinking. Here is our intrapersonal communication. Let your mind dwell on these things, things that are good and noble and right and pure and lovely. And then what Paul would tell us in Colossians chapter 3 In verse 2, since we have been raised up with Christ, we are to set our mind on things that are above and not on things here on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. We are to set our minds on things that are above. And so I hope you see, just as we start here, God talks to us often in his word about how we think, what we think about, how we are to think. 
These are all biblical concepts, and this is everything that intrapersonal communication is all about. Now, I told you at the beginning, we want to focus this really on our brethren. That's the, that's the route we want to take this morning. So begin by thinking with me about this question. How do I think about my brethren? How do I think about my brethren? How do you think about your brethren? And there are lots of applications we could make with this question, but I want you to notice that as we're talking about how we think about our brethren, that the Holy Spirit would really focus on how we think about our brethren in a, in a local sense, how we think about our brethren in the local church. That's really the, the functional unit of the New Testament is the local church. Most all of us here know brethren in other churches, maybe in other churches in other states, maybe uh, other brethren in other churches in other countries. But as we go through the New Testament, it pretty solidly would focus our attention on the brethren of the local church of which we are a part. That is first and foremost and primarily where our one another efforts need to be addressed, need to be focused. So look, for example, at Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romanos capitulo 12 verso 10, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, where the Holy Spirit through Paul would instruct us to be devoted to one another in brotherly love giving preference to one another in honor. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 33. Primero de Corintios, capítulo 11, verso 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Here's another one of our one another passages in the context of the local church. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Galatas, capítulo 5. Uh, verso 13, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, what Connor read for us just a moment ago. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Ephesians capítulo 4, verso 30, 32. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. As you look at all of those passages, all of these one another passages uh, that Kent and Travis and Todd and Mitch have taken us through this year, all of these one another passages that we're seeing right here are all focused primarily and originally on relationships that are found in the local church. Now, it is good and it is right for us to have relationships with brethren in other places, in other cities, in other states, in other countries, that's fantastic. And there are times when our minds are called to such things. I'm, I'm thinking about Peter and his instructions to us about considering our brethren who are undergoing the same trials as us throughout the world. There is a time and a place certainly for us to consider our brethren who are in far off places from us. But sometimes I'm convinced we lose sight of the fact that God wants us to focus on the local church and our relationships in the local church. And that all begins with how we think about each other in the local church, appreciating each other in the local church. And understanding here that, that when we're talking about brethren in the local church, using this phrase, my brethren, is, is certainly a biblical concept. And perhaps one we ought to integrate into our terminology a little bit more. Look at Romans chapter 12, Romanos capitulo 12, verso 4, Romans chapter 12. Looking over here in verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Members of one another. 
So using this phrase, my brethren, certainly is a biblical concept. We are members one of another. We are integrated together. We work together. We function together. We serve together. In verse 16, we are to be of the same mind. Verse 16, verso 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do we appreciate this relationship that we have with each other through Jesus Christ? Certainly that's what's being emphasized to us in all of these one another passages that we need to appreciate each other. We need to love each other and everything that that involves. We need to think about each other. And that's where we're focused this morning. So three, three simple points this morning about how I must think about my brethren. The, the inner dialogue, the inner, not the inner dialogue, inner monologue, that might be better. If you're talking back to yourself, we might need to have a conversation. The inner monologue we need to have within ourselves about our brethren, how I must think about my brethren. And number one being, I just got to do it. I need to think about my brethren. Look over here with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Primero de Thessalonicenses, capítulo 4, verso 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and beginning over here in verse 9. If I am going to think about my brethren like God encourages me to, like God calls me to, that the first thing I've got to do is I actually got to think about them. That I have to be disciplined enough, aware enough within myself to, to consciously direct my thoughts away from myself and towards others, considering other people, right? This is the biblical concept of selflessness, being willing to consider others. Start with me here in verse 9 of chapter 4. Writing to this very young church that Paul seemingly has just been separated from for a few weeks. He says to them, now as to the love of brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. So as we think about thinking about our brethren, what does he say here? Number one, they were doing pretty well, weren't they? This young church, uh, young in existence, young in the faith. But one of the things that they, they had a rather solid grasp on, beginning there in verse 9, was what? Their, their love of one another. Love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Uh, you don't need me, Paul says, to write to you more about loving one another because that's something that has been accomplished by God in times before. You understand you're supposed to love each other. Paul says, I don't have to write to you more about that. But when Paul says, I don't have to write to you more about that, that's usually a good indication that he's about to do what? Write to you a little bit more about that, and that's what he's going to do here in verse 10. Notice what he says in verse 10. For indeed you do practice it to all of the brethren who are in where? Who are in Macedonia. Now, Thessalonica is a city in Macedonia at this time. You've also got Berea, and you've got Philippi. Those are two other notable cities in the Macedonian province. Notice how Paul phrases it here in verse, verse, verse 10. You, you do this, you love your brethren, you, you excel at loving your brethren who are in Macedonia. But then he says, but I urge you to excel still more in this. This is something you, you're doing good in, but, but excel in it still more, verse 11. And then he gives them some specific instructions that are directed where? I get this, at home. They did well to love their brethren who were in Macedonia, and then he instructs them about their conduct and relationships in Thessalonica, in the city of Thessalonica, in the church 
at Thessalonica. You know, what, what that communicates to me as I'm reading this, and maybe you're catching this too, there are, there are times in our lives perhaps where it's easier to love and serve those who are distant to us. It's, it's sometimes easier to foster these kind of relationships when you're not with somebody all the time. You know, we think, for example, about some of the individual type efforts that go on around us, right? Uh, youth get-togethers, old people get-togethers, camps, things like that. All individually funded, what we're describing here. And, and sometimes, and I say this as somebody who went to some of these, you know, we, we walk away thinking that this is just the, the spiritual zenith, Right? This is the mountaintop experience of Christianity. But do, do, you, do you know what I, what I don't read about in my Bible? That, that the camps, that the weekends, whether for old or young or in between, that they're necessary to our spiritual vitality. But what I do read about in Scripture that's absolutely necessary to our spiritual lives and our spiritual well-being is what? This right here. The local church and our assembling together. And sometimes it's, it's easy to love the people that we don't see all the time. Because you tell me if I'm right or not, you can shake or nod, wink or blink. But uh, there are times when we're just around people for a short period of time, we can kind of put on that mask, can't we? We can put on airs. But you can't really do that week in and week out, can you? I mean, the people here, we see each other, we know each other. We know our ups and we know our downs. We know when we're excelling and we know when we're suffering and struggling. But this, this... This is the family that God has given us. This is the local body described in Romans chapter 12. And we need to be focused on each other. Yes, it's good and right and proper to think about brethren elsewhere. And please don't walk away from this study thinking I'm saying we don't need to think about anyone but us. That's not my point. But my point is we do need to be making conscious directed efforts both externally and internally how i think about this group right here we have a relationship with one another a relationship given to us by god it's it's not that we discount others it's the principle we see back in matthew's gospel count these you ought to have done jesus says without leaving the others undone justice and mercy and faith and love and tithe of mint and cumin and anise. You ought to have done these without leaving the others undone. We, we can do both. We should do both. But we need to make sure that we're focusing on each other, that we're supporting each other, that we're looking out for the needs of each other and responding to them. That is where first and foremost we see these one another passages in the New Testament coming to life. The very first thing God would tell us about thinking our, about our brethren is that well, we've just got to do it. We've got to train ourselves and make the effort to think about each other. I want to share with you a quote. This is a, a Syrian satirist in the second century, real stunner of a fellow, by the name of Lucian of Samosata. And I want you to listen in, in, in his work called The Passing of Peregrinus. Here's what he had to say. He was not a fan of Christianity. In fact, he routinely mocked it and belittled it. But here's what he noted at one point about Christians. He said, the activity of these people, the Christians, in dealing with any matter that affects their community is something extraordinary. They spare no trouble, no expense. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. 
And then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. All this they take quite on trust with the result that they despise all worldly goods alike regarding them merely as common property. Second century, so let's call it 50, 60 70 years after 1 John was written, this is what the world knew about Christianity. Pretty good description, isn't it? And this is how Christians were known for acting. What did they do? They took care of each other. And of course, that's what people would see publicly. They, they would see the Maybe the, the, the financial, the outward caring, right? But I guarantee you what was going along alongside of that, it wasn't just outward, it was also the sitting with people, wasn't it? Praying with people. Encouraging, weeping and grieving together, rejoicing together. All of these different principles coming together. Being seen by the world. This as how Christians were noted for acting here at the very beginning of Christianity. How else must I think about my brethren? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Primero de Corintios capítulo 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How must I think about my brethren? So number one, I've actually got to think about them. But number two, when I think about them, I've got to think about them in the most positive light that I can. I must ascribe to them the best of intentions and motivations. And isn't, isn't the opposite of this just a sorry way to go through this life? I mean, what a, what a depressing and overwhelming way to go through life when we look at everyone around us suspiciously. And, and it's understandable why some people might do that. There are some people who in their upbringing experienced episodes of abuse and neglect. And certainly for some, the, the ability to trust and the ability to look at others and ascribe to them the best of motivations, for some that is exceedingly difficult. But it's something we've got to work toward. It's something we've got to eventually embrace. We've got to ascribe to our brothers and sisters, and specifically right where are we talking about? Not talking about our far-flung brethren out there in Arkansas and Mississippi and Louisiana, right? We're talking about right here, University Oaks. We've got to think positively about each other before we start interacting with each other. Got to think positively about each other. The context in which we find what we're going to read here in just a moment in verse 7 is, is in a local church that had problems. And one of the most notable problems here at the church in Corinth was what? Their lack of love for each other, which affected all sorts of things. The church was div divided and splintered. Uh, the, the, the church was divided even as it came down into their very assemblies. Could you imagine... Uh, such a division here at, at University Oaks where certain ones of us met earlier to the exclusion of others, making sure that some could be here and that certain others just simply could not be here. And we might say, well, that's just awful and beyond the pale, and I would agree with you, but that's exactly what was happening in Corinth. To a church that was struggling with the ability to love each other and interact positively with each other, Here's what the Holy Spirit said to them, beginning in verse 4, verso 4. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not easily provoked. What does that mean? Love's not always looking to be offended. 
Love's not always looking for an opportunity to be offended at what someone else says or what someone else does or the mere fact of someone else's existence. Love does not seek its own, is not easily provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffer. The King James translation of this is love thinks what? Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. And now verse 7, love does what? Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. When we read those phrases there, love believes all things. And love hopes all things. What does that tell us? How does that tell us about the way that we think about our brethren? What this passage says is when we're thinking about our brethren, when we're trying to process maybe something that our brethren have done, something they have said, that the filter through which we're processing that is the filter of best intentions. That I'm going to look at how my brother or sister behaves towards me And if I am confused by it, the first thing I'm going to do is what? I'm going to train myself to look at what they do and think about it in the most positive light I can. And I'm going to pursue that line of thinking until it's just absolutely impossible, until the facts slap me up beside the head and say, you just can't do that. Paul is not encouraging Christians to come in here and kind of bury our heads in the sand and pretend like reality is not there. But all of us have to filter every action we see, every word we hear. We filter all of it. And what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do here is what? Filter it all through the best of intentions. If we are brethren, if we are members one of another then I am going to look at my brothers and sisters and I'm going to ascribe them the best of intentions. If we have a get-together sometime and John and Robin walk away with my favorite Tupperware platter, I'm not going to sit here and think, John, they're just thieves. They knew that was my favorite Tupperware and they walked away with it. They're just sorry people. I'm going to think what? They just picked it up on accident, and if I simply tell them, hey, did you happen to pick up my Tupperware? They go, sure. Oh, I thought it was ours. I'm so sorry. Here it is back. Had that actual thing happen at a church I used to be a part of, folks got upset, and it was all a big misunderstanding. And we might think, wow, I can't believe that happened. I guarantee you things like that have happened before, haven't they? The challenge is for us, and here it is, it's not when times are going well. This really comes into play when things are difficult and challenging for us. It's easy to ascribe the best of intentions when everything in our lives is going great. It's when things in our lives are challenging that we really have to work to make sure that this filter is going. If I love my brethren, I'm going to think about them the way that God calls me to think about them. And what God is going to tell me to do is think about them in the most positive way I can. Love believes all things and hopes all things. When I'm struggling to interpret what's gone on with a brother or a sister, what I'm going to do first and foremost is ascribe them the best of intentions. And you know what? I may still be confused after I do that. That may just stick with me and be something I really have to sort through. So then here comes this. Number three, then I've got to be willing and eager to seek reconciliation. I think it was John Wooden who said when he was describing the kind of basketball player he wanted to play for him at UCLA, I think it was John Wooden who said, I don't want someone who is willing to sacrifice for the team. I want someone who is eager to sacrifice for the team. We have to be both willing and eager 
to seek reconciliation. Let me show you two ways, two different forms of how this presents itself to us. There are times, as you flip over with me to Matthew chapter 18, there are times where someone has sinned against me. Mateo capítulo 18, verso 15, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. And in these moments where someone has, has clearly and notably and understandably sinned against me, Jesus tells us exactly how we're supposed to handle that. And he tells us how we're supposed to handle it. Get this, in the context of the local church, Jesus describes our interactions in the local church here in Matthew 18 before the local church is even established. He's talking to us about how we are to behave in the local church. He says this beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins, if your brother sins against you, reprove him in private. If he listens, you have won your brother. You know what he didn't say? If your brother sins against you, sit and stew on it for a little while. You know what he didn't say? If your brother sins against you, go tell someone on this side of the auditorium. That's not what he said, is it? If your brother sins against you, do what? Go to him privately. Right? We're not talking about some big public sin here, a la 1 Corinthians 15. We're talking here, what he's talking about, if your brother sins against you, we're talking about private sins, aren't we? If your brother sins against you, do what? Go to him. How much trouble, how much angst is alleviated when I think my brother might have sinned against me and I go to him and I talk about it and we keep it private and we sort through it. And we do just exactly what Jesus called us to do. So much heartache and grief is saved when we do simply what Jesus calls us to do. But what if I'm not successful? What if I go to him and say, Frank, you did me wrong. Frank says, no, I didn't. I'm not changing. Or maybe it's me, Frank. So what do we do then? Take another one along with us, right? If he refuses to hear you, going on to the next verse, verse 16, take one or two with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. And if he does not hear them, then we are supposed to do what in verse 17? Take it to the church. Here's local church right here. Everything that we've been saying here is all in the context of what? One another in the local church. Willing and eager to seek reconciliation. Okay, Tyler. But, but what he or she did to me, it's, it's not sin. And it just sticks with me. You know Jesus talks about this too? Look at Matthew chapter 5. Mateo capitulo 5, verso 23. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. There are times in our lives where, where, where we get kind of sideways with somebody. And, and it's not necessarily that sin is in the picture. Just miscommunications happen, misperceptions occur, issues pop up. And Jesus talks to us about how to handle these as well. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, so... Jesus, of course, is speaking back in the time that the law of Moses was in effect. Here is someone coming to do an act of worship, and that's how we need to understand this passage today. Here is someone coming to offer their worship before God. And as I'm coming to offer my worship before God, I remember that my brother has something against me. Now, notice how he describes this here. Has the brother sinned against me? He doesn't say that. Have I sinned against my brother? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say if what my brother has against me is legitimate or not, does he? He says, my brother has something against me. Then what am I supposed to do in verse 24? Leave your offering there before the altar. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and make your offering. Willing and eager to seek reconciliation. You know what I don't do? I don't just sit on it. I don't stew about it. 
I don't let it fester and boil and grow inside of me so that it eventually it consumes me. I don't let it tear down that filter that we talked about in 1 Corinthians 13. But rather what I do, the moment that, that I have this challenge in my life, what do I do? What does he say? Go to them. Go to them. Don't go out to somebody who then goes to somebody who then goes to them. You don't even have to go to the elders. You come to our elders with something like this, what are our elders going to tell you? First question they're going to ask you, have you talked to them about it? You know why they ask that question? Because that's just exactly what Jesus told us to do, isn't it? Go talk to them. i got to think about my brethren. i got to think about my brethren in the most positive light that I can. And I've got to be willing and eager to seek reconciliation. How we think about each other is so vitally important. Before we start acting towards one another as one another should, it first starts with how we think about one another. We've got to think about each other. We've got to think about each other positively. We've got to give and ascribe the best of intentions to each other. And when we have these issues and these hardships, which will inevitably arise in our lives, look, it, it doesn't always have to be sin. Sometimes it's simple misunderstandings, and simple misunderstandings happen. But how drastically sad for simple misunderstandings to destroy friendships and to destroy relationships and to destroy local churches when it could all be resolved with what? A conversation. Two Christians just doing exactly what they need to do. As we wrap up, I want you to think with me about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. What begins and ends this whole discussion is being children of God. It's when you and I become children of God when we choose to put on Christ and baptism and leave a life of sin behind. It's in that moment that we begin not only a new relationship with Jesus and with our Heavenly Father, it's when we begin a new relationship with the people of God. It's when we become brethren. In Matthew chapter 12, one time while Jesus was preaching and healing, his mother and his brothers were standing outside trying to speak to him. And someone came and kind of interrupted Jesus and said, Master, your, your mother and your brothers, they're trying to find you to speak with you. Do you remember what Jesus said in response? Jesus took his hands and he stretched them out towards his disciples and he said, what? Whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. We are family. There is the entire family of God that is born from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then there is a local family, a local body. And that's what we are here. A local body of believers joined together by mutual obedience in doing the will of our Father who is in heaven. A body of believers joined together by our mutual obedience to the Father by having turned from a life of sin and confessed Jesus as our Savior and putting Him on in baptism and raising to walk a new life. We are brethren. And so how we think about each other is so vitally important because how we think about each other is ultimately how we're going to act towards each other. And if God has instructed us, as we have seen over the course of this year, about how we're to act towards one another, the very first thing we have to get right is how we think about each other. We've got to think about each other. We've got to think about each other positively. And if issues arrive, we've got to be willing and eager to seek reconciliation. And in that way, we honor our Father who is in heaven, and we honor the one who loved us 
and who gave himself for us, who shed his blood so that we might be forgiven. If you look at your life this morning and you're outside of a relationship with Jesus who loves you, who gave himself for you, if you've never come to his blood, you can come to him today. Confess him as your Savior, turn from a life of sin, be united with him in baptism and raised to walk a new life. But maybe if you look at your life as a Christian, you haven't been relating to your brothers and sisters as you should. And you want to change and you want the support of this congregation to help you change. We stand ready and willing to help. If we can do anything to help you respond to the gospel this morning, would you come while we stand and while we sing?